A number of years ago, while we were uh, in the process of purchasing this property and building this building, uh, we had the opportunity to meet with some representatives from the Williams Creek HOA, which is the, uh, the neighborhood that's just kind of over this direction. And uh, they were great. They were hospitable. They were encouraging. I want to say that very, very clearly. I know some of you live in the Williams Creek neighborhood. Before I tell this story, we love the Williams Creek neighborhood. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, but, you know, in the context of, we had one meeting with the HOA, and in the context of that meeting, some people asked some questions about what it was going to be like to have us, this church, here on this property right next to their neighborhood. Uh, you know, great questions. Are, are the lights going to be really bright? Uh, you know, are they going to disturb us? How are you going to make sure that the noise isn't too much on Sunday morning as you guys uh, have worship music going? And good questions. And so we answered the questions. But I will never forget, in the process of this conversation, uh, there was one uh, woman who raised her hand and she said, I have a question. We're like, okay. And she said, do you anticipate that we will hear the sound of children playing? And uh, I was like, I I, I was really struggling to process the question. I was like, well, like, what, what is your concern about it? She's like, well, you know, I know sometimes kids can be loud. They can scream. They can play. Do you anticipate that we'll have to hear the sound of children playing? And so it was everything I could do at that moment, not not to let the natural sort of sarcasm that's often in my heart out of my mouth. But, but I did say, I was like, well, you know, there will be children around. I can't guarantee that the occasional, you know, stray sound of a happy child won't drift over <laughs> to your property, right? But there's a pretty big, like, tree buffer. There's a pretty big distance, you know. So we kind of moved on with the conversation. So after the meeting, another woman comes up to me, about the same age as the first woman. They were both maybe, maybe in their 70s, maybe even a little bit older. But, but another lady comes up to me, and she goes, look. She goes, I just want you to know I love the sound of happy children. (laughs) And she said, she goes, I told my, I leaned over to my husband and I said, if I ever get to the place where I hate the sound of children laughing, just put me in a home. (laughs) So every time I think about that story though, I think, you know, when we talk about God and we talk about God's boundaries for our lives, I think some of us think about God like that, like that first person that God is up in the heavens and he's going, wait a minute, I think I hear some happy people. And he's trying to squish us. And I think especially when we begin to talk about these issues of sex and marriage and gender in a culture that promotes absolute liberty to do or think or believe whatever you think is right, when we live in that kind of a world, people tend to say, look, the the, the standards of the scripture are restrictive and they represent a God who has no other design for your life other than to make you unhappy. And so the question that a lot of times comes up, and I think the question that we need to answer pretty well before we dive in over the next few weeks to some specifics on these topics of gender and sexuality, I think the question we need to ask first is why does God care? Why does God care in the first place about how I use my body? Why does God care in the first place about my sexuality or my gender identity, or any of those questions? Why does God even care about those issues? Is it that God says, look, I just don't like people enjoying themselves or having freedom in life? Is it because God is overly controlling? Is it because God is just nosy and likes getting into our business? Why does he care? And what we're going to see is that God is actually a whole lot more like that second woman who came up to me than the first woman. He is a whole lot more like the person who says, I love, I love when my people experience joy and fullness of life and when they're living in accordance with the purpose for which they were made. God would say, I created joy. I created love. I created marriage. I created sex. I created male and female. And when you live according to the design for which I created these things, it's not that your life will be pain-free or perfect, but it is the best way to find a life in harmony with our maker and in harmony 
with one another. It is the best pathway toward a life of joy. So what we're gonna see is God cares about how we use our bodies because God cares about us. God cares about how we use our bodies because God cares about us. He loves us. He wants the best for us. So that God isn't up in heaven looking for happy people to squish, but instead he's saying, I have designed a world to function in the best way for you. And I've designed you to function in a particular way with your mind, your spirit, and your body. And so I care because I, because I love you. And that's what we're going to look at as we begin this series this morning. I want to offer a few reasons why God cares how we use our bodies. We're going to be in a a few different passages. Uh, We'll be in Genesis 1 a bit, and we will also be in 1 Corinthians 6 for a while. I'll have all the passages this morning up on the screen, but we'll spend a lot of time in 1 Corinthians 6 if you want to read along with me when we get there. But we will, we will begin probably before that in Genesis 1. And the question that's really going to frame our morning as we talk about this is simply this. Do I really believe that God's boundaries around sex and marriage and gender, that God's boundaries exist because he loves me? And if that's true, will I and will you, will we submit our beliefs and our behaviors surrounding our sexuality? Will we submit those realities to the truth of God's word? Will we submit those areas of our lives to the truth of God's word once we understand why God even cares about how we use our bodies and how we use our sexuality? All right, why does God care about how we use our bodies? Here's the first reason this morning, because our bodies bear his image. Our bodies bear his image. Now, we're going to break this down uh, in, in detail this morning, but here's what I mean that the image of God is not simply reserved to your, your spiritual essence. But in fact, when you and I were created, when Adam and Eve were created, we are created in the image of God, body and spirit together. That your body is a big part of how you reflect the image of God. Now, we know God doesn't have a body. We understand that, all right? But your body and my body reflects God's image and God's nature. So let me, let me show you a couple of passages and then we'll, we'll break this down. All right, Genesis 1, we saw this a few minutes ago. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. All right, so this is interesting that God says, we're gonna make people in our image, right? I'm gonna make mankind in my image. But notice this, that right here at the end, it says, in his image, male and female. Now, next week, we're gonna talk in more detail about the male and female part and, and why that reflects God's image and why that's so important. But, but what I wanna do today is simply make one point. Your maleness and your femaleness, right? Those are uh, a reflection in some way of the image of God. That you and I are made in a way that our, our sex, male or female, is somehow tied to our nature, and that nature, body and spirit, reflects the image of God. It's not just your spiritual essence. It's actually also your body. All right, so what is an image? This will help us for a minute. An image is a, is a visible representation of something else. So if you take a selfie with your phone, and then you post it on Instagram or wherever, Facebook. That selfie isn't you, right? That selfie is an image of you, a reflection of you. That's why often we take such care to make sure that the selfie is from the right angle with the right lighting and the right hair. Why? Because we want an image that we feel reflects the best of us so that we can post that. We want the image to reflect who we believe we are, right? That's what an image is. Now, in the ancient world, especially in pagan or idolatrous contexts, what people would do is they would worship an invisible God, and then they would make a visible representation of that visible God. We call that an idol, 
right? So, so they would have these idols. The idols were not meant to be the God. The idols were a visible representation of an invisible thing. When God creates mankind, he says, actually, you, you are the visible image of an invisible God. You see that? You and I, made in the image of God, are physical, visible beings that represent the character and the glory of the God who made us. That includes our bodies and that includes our spirit. Now, when we get into the New Testament, what we're going to see is there is a man who is the perfect representation of the invisible God. We know it's Jesus, right? So Jesus is the perfect image of God. What does Jesus do? He reflects God's character perfectly. Everything he says with his mouth, everything he does with his hands, everywhere he goes with his feet, everything he thinks is a reflection of the character and the image of God. So much so that in Colossians 1, Paul would say he, that is Jesus, is the image, right? The visible image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. That is, he has preeminence over all of God's creation. He inherits all of God's creation. He is the preeminent human being. I want want us to understand this because this is really important. When God wants us to know what he's like, it's not only that he tells us what he's like through words, but John says what? The word became flesh. The reality of who God is became flesh in Jesus Christ. God says, part of you understanding my image is I am going to allow and send my son, the second person of the Trinity, God to become flesh. Because part of the image of God involves physicality. Not because God has a body, but because to reflect his image is helped and assisted by being able to see in visible form what God is like. So what does that mean? Well, the image of God, uh, we've talked about this in in, uh, times past in here. I've done whole sermons on the image of God, but let me me summarize then. What does the image of God consist of? We are going somewhere, by the way, when we talk about sexuality, because this is really important, but we need to understand this. The image of God means a few things. One, I can relate to God spiritually, right? It means that I have a capacity to connect with God and relate to God in a way that my dog does not, that my cat does not, that a chimpanzee does not. I can relate to God in a way that involves a spirit, an eternal and immortal spirit that relates to God now and forever. It also means I can reflect God's character. God is holy. God is loving. God is truthful. God is filled with everything good. Now, the only way that I am able to reflect God's character, if you think about this, uh, is is actually through the use of my body. Think about that. Uh, Love, how how do I see love? Well, the way I treat other people, the things I do or say to other people, right? Truthfulness, how do I reflect God's truthful character with what I say, with what I write, with how I live, right? So there is a bodily aspect to the reflection of God's character. The only way you and I interact with the world, in fact, is through our bodies. I see things, I hear things, I say things, I smell, I touch, right? I think about things. It is through my physical body that I reflect the character of God. Now, here's the one also that is always a little bit odd for people, but I think is biblically true. We are also designed to radiate God's glory. What I mean in layman's terms is we're meant to shine. We're made for it. Let me give you some biblical background for that, some biblical validation for that. You may remember Moses, right, as he is leading the people around in the wilderness. What would happen whenever Moses would go in to the presence of God and then come back out? You remember this? When Moses came down, this is on Mount Sinai, with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant. Think about that. Moses became shiny. Why? Because he had spoken with the Lord. And everybody around was like, Moses, put a veil on, man. It's too much. Because his body in the presence of God was designed to reflect physically God's glory, God's light. So you're like, why am I not shiny? I want to be shiny. Well, the reason is because sin has obscured our ability to reflect God's image, both morally and spiritually, but also physically. Uh, Jesus, 
is transfigured before his disciples. And what happens? His face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as the light. Jesus, as the perfect God-man, shines and radiates the glory of God in his body. In Daniel chapter 12, Daniel says, but the wise will shine. This is in the resurrection. They will shine like the brightness of the heavenly expanse, and those bringing many to righteousness will be like the stars forever and ever. We are made to shine. I don't think that's metaphorical. I think we are designed to reflect God's character and then bodily to radiate his glory. Philippians chapter three, talking about the resurrection body. But our citizenship is in heaven and we also await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform these humble bodies of ours into the likeness of his, that is Jesus' glorious body by means of that power which he is able to subject all things to himself. That Paul says, and we'll talk about resurrection in a minute, but Paul says, in the resurrection, we will have the glory that reflects the glory that Jesus has in his resurrected body. So when John the apostle in Revelation sees Jesus as a lamb slain, he's still human, he's still a person, he's wearing clothes, he has a human form, but he's bright and he radiates the glory of God. Because again, body and spirit, we are meant to reflect God's character with what we do and eventually to radiate God's glory. So what that means is that our bodies even now, we're designed to live in such a way, to exist in such a way that we as God's image in every way reflect his character and reflect his glory. This is why in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul would say, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for what? The glory of God whether you're eating a sandwich, whether you're drinking, whether you are uh, doing anything, and this would include your, your sexuality. He's gonna say, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. You are made to reflect him. You are his visible image, the visible image of an invisible God. That's what we're made for. Our bodies are made for. I'm curious how many uh, went out and, and tried to watch the eclipse this past week. I did. We had a a meeting and uh, we moved the meeting out here on our front porch with some of our staff so that we could watch the eclipse. I was the only one who brought eclipse glasses. I let them borrow my eclipse glasses. I didn't even charge them for it. However, I paid $4 for these. If you'd like them for half price to save them till 2044, by all means. All right, but but think about the eclipse for a minute. Uh, So we were not in the path of totality. It was like 98.4% totality here. My brother lived in the path of totality, and so he took a picture, he took this picture of the eclipse from the path of totality. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Isn't it weird to see the moon blocking out the light of the sun? I mean, that's weird, right? Why is it, why is it so weird? Well, it doesn't happen very often, but the reason I think it's so weird is because that's not normally the moon's job. That's not normally what the moon does, right? Right? What does the moon normally do? What is the moon supposed to do? The moon actually reflects the light of the sun and radiates it to us. So when it gets in the way of the sun, like that's cool once every 20 years or so, but if it always did that, we'd be like, man, move out of the way so I can see what's going on, right? You and I are designed not to block the light of God's glory, by living sexually, personally in a way that defiles the image of God, we're actually designed to reflect the image of God, to take the light of God into our hearts, our minds, and bodies and reflect it back out. We are like the moon reflecting the light of God. That's how we're made. And so God cares about how we use our bodies because they bear, they bear his image. We're made in his image to reflect him in every way. But it's not just that we bear his image, it's also that our bodies, in fact, belong to Jesus. Our bodies belong to Jesus. They're not our own. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, your body doesn't belong to you. My body doesn't belong to me. This is really countercultural because in our culture, we are a libertarian culture, especially in the United States where people say, I should be able to do whatever I want with my body 
or to my body as long as I'm not using my body like to punch you in the face, right? My, my rights for my body, people would say, end where your body begins. Now, as a culture, there may be some value in that statement. But biblically speaking, actually, my rights to my body end where Jesus' ownership of me begins because I belong to him. And so I want to look, 1 Corinthians 6, I'm going to look at this passage for just a few minutes because this is a passage in which the Apostle Paul lays out why sexual immorality is wrong. And he talks about how our bodies are made to function and how they belong to Jesus. So, so I wanna, I'm going to walk through this passage and I, I want to explain it and then offer a couple of applications that I think relate to how we think about this topic of sex and gender. All right, so 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul begins and he says, all things are lawful for me. Now that's in quotes, probably because this was, this was a, a phrase of saying that the Corinthians, these, these new Christians, these new Gentile Christians, they were using this phrase to say, look, I'm not under the law of Moses. And so everything's lawful for me. I can do whatever I want. And if I'm going to go to heaven anyway when I die, right, I'm going to be separated from my body. And therefore, what does it even matter uh, whether I obey God's standards with my body? Like everything's lawful for me. And Paul says, okay, but not everything is, is beneficial. Not everything is good. In other words, everything technically might be lawful in the sense that you're not under the law of Moses, but not everything promotes uh, closeness with God, harmony with others. Not everything helps you reflect God's character and image. Not everything is good. Not everything is beneficial. Again, all things are lawful for me. He goes, but I will not be controlled by anything. This is really important because the illusion, and in this context, again, we'll see, he's talking about sexual immorality and very specifically about prostitution. And he says, look, I'm not going to be controlled by anything. Here's, here's where he's going. Is we, we all know that sexuality, when indulged, can enslave. I think we all know that. That indulging in sin, and, and in some way, especially sexual sin, it begins in this feeling of freedom. I can break outside of God's boundaries. But it almost always, in fact, I would say always ends in a feeling of slavery. I cannot escape what I thought was liberty because now I carry around in my body these increasing desires to indulge my flesh in ways that are opposed to God's plan. And so Paul says, I don't want to be controlled by any bodily desire, especially related to my sexuality. Now he goes on, he says, look, food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food, but God will do away with both. What I think he's getting at here is, is really pretty simple. He goes, look, the reason you have a stomach is to eat food. That's what it's for. So if you eat a sandwich, if you eat a steak, your stomach is made for food. But we understand, look, that, that cookie or whatever, it's not, it's not eternal. It's not really going to stay with you forever, right? Now, you may be like, it will stay with me forever in some way, okay? But you got to follow Paul's, Paul's argument here. He's saying, look... The matter of eating and drinking fundamentally is not as eternal an issue as what you do with your body sexually. It's not that it's unimportant. It's not that we, we don't take care with what we eat and all of that. But he's saying, look, food's for the stomach, stomach's for the food. That's what it's made for. You are made to eat. God will do away eventually with both. The day will come when this issue of like how we uh, eat and our diets and, and digestion and all of those things, that will not be apparently in the kingdom of God uh, an issue of eternal importance, right? So uh, I will not need to worry about the extra cookie, right? Praise God, that day is coming. All right, but he goes, food's for the stomach, stomach's for the food. God will do away with both. But, but here's the analogy. Your body is not for sexual immorality. Your stomach's made for food. Your body is not made for using your body sexually in ways that violate God's design. But your body instead is for the Lord. And the Lord, look at this, is for the body. In other words, God wants what's best for your body because your body belongs to him. Your body is not made for sexual immorality. And so he's going to go on and he's going he's to continue this argument. He's going to say, now, God indeed raised to the Lord and will raise us by his power. I'll come back to that concept in a minute. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? 
Should I take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. All right, so, so what is he getting at? He goes, when you trusted in Jesus, you were united to Jesus. And what that means is now you are a member of the body of Jesus. So you belong to Jesus. You are one member of the global, eternal body of Jesus Christ. And he goes, I want you to understand, you don't take a member of Jesus. You don't take a part of Jesus' body and unite it to a prostitute. And that's what you're doing when you engage in sexual immorality. You are saying, I'm, yeah, I want to be united to Jesus. I want to be a part of his body. I want to be connected to him. But I'm going to implicate Jesus in sexual immorality. And so he says, no, no, no. You don't do that. Never. May it never be. Do you not know that anyone who is united with a prostitute is one body with her? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. So here he's quoting Genesis 1 again. But the one united with the Lord is one spirit with him. In other words, you are first and foremost united to Jesus. And that means I don't take a member of the body of Christ and engage in sexual activity that communicates I am now united with the world. I am united with this other person. I am united with somebody or something other than or opposed to the purposes of Jesus. All right, so he says you're united to Jesus. Now he's going to go on and he says, look, every, he says flee sexual immorality Every sin a person commits is outside the body, but the immoral person sins against his own body. Now, again, you're like, what does that exactly mean? Here's what I think he means. Okay, because you're, you're like, look, I mean, overeating, that's a bodily issue, right? Uh, drinking alcohol or doing drugs, that's a bodily issue, right? But here's what he's saying. Uh, the, the alcohol or the food or whatever, it's not a part of me, right? The, the large batch of cookies that's sitting on your counter, it doesn't move around with you. It's not a part of you. It's outside of you. But your sexuality, your maleness, your femaleness, how you interact sexually, it's a part of your body. You carry around with you the image of God in your maleness and your femaleness. So to sin against the image of God in that way is to sin against an aspect of your humanity that is, in fact, central to who we are as made in the image of God. It is a sin against one's own body. Or do you not know, and here's where he goes, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God with your body. Now, what's interesting is this, this temple analogy is often used when we talk about like going to work out or, or eating healthy or whatever. And I think that slightly misses Paul's argument. I'm not saying, again, that that's unimportant. But his argument here is specifically about sexual immorality. And here's what, what I think he's trying to get at. Again, in the ancient world, the, the, the pagans would often build temples to their gods. And some of the worship of pagan gods like Baal involved what you call cultic prostitution. They would engage in prostitution inside their temples, of worship in order to get their false gods to do what they wanted them to do. And Paul says, no, 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 we don't do that. The Jews did not do that. That was blasphemy and a violation of God's temple because in the temple of God, you only worship and unite yourself to God. Now here's where he goes. You as a believer in Jesus Christ, now you are the temple. And so if you would not engage in this behavior in the temple of God, you should not engage in it at all. If you would not walk in amongst the people of God and engage in this behavior amongst them in the church, in the temple, remember, you're the temple. So we do not engage in sexual immorality with the temple. Why? You were bought at a price. You were bought at a price. Jesus died for you and rose again and secured your life and your resurrection and your body at the cost of his own life. Therefore, glorify God with your body. All right, so again, Paul's fundamental argument is your body belongs to Jesus. It doesn't belong to you. My body doesn't belong to me. So I don't get to do whatever I want as long as I'm not hurting you. And we're going to see in future weeks, in fact, that the argument that says sexual immorality doesn't really hurt anyone is a false argument anyway. 
right? But, but the idea is, first and foremost, I'm made to bear God's image. I belong to Jesus. Uh, a couple of months ago, my car had to go to the shop. And so uh, while it was in the shop, I was corresponding with my friend Blake. And some of you know Blake uh, Jennings. He uh, leads OnRamp here in this community. So they give away cars to uh, those in need who can't afford cars. But Blake also has a hobby where he, he buys older sports cars. He fixes them up and then he resells them um, sometimes for, in fact, usually for more than he bought them for in the first place. So, so my car was in the shop and I told him that my car was in the shop and he said, uh, would you like uh, to borrow my, my Boxster for a few days? And I said, would I? So I uh, passed her in a Porsche, man. I had such a fun time in Blake's Boxster for like three days. Now, uh, he, he just, he had babied this car, right? It was just, it was pristine. He had, he had shined the upholstery. I mean, everything was just beautiful on this car. So you can imagine, I wanted to have fun, but Blake, Blake had given me some boundaries. He's like, you know, until it warms up a little bit, don't push it over 4,000 RPM. And so like for me, I'm like, I'm not gonna do that like at all anyway, because I don't know what, what that's gonna do. And so I didn't do it, but I'm like, I had fun, but I was careful, right? So as, as we were going, like on the day, I was like, I need to go return it. I got my car back. I had kind of told him, you know, enough times, like it's gonna be months before my car gets back. So my car is finally... My, my car is finally done. I'm like, all right, I'm going to return the car. And so Shannon, she's like, hey, can, can I drive it back over to his house? So I'm like, all right. So she's like, she gets in, she backs out. She's like, before we go, could you just, could you take a few pictures of me in the car? <laughs> and so, so, so like, this is not the only one. Like, there's like a whole roll of this, right? So like from various different angles. And I, I'm like, look, look how, how joyful she is at this. You know, I come home actually every single day and I rarely see that much happiness when I come in the room, all right? So, so she's like, let me drive it, right? But even she, it was crazy. Like, she was like, this is so fun. But I was behind her, and I could tell she's going even more cautiously in this car than she would in her own. Why? Because it wasn't ours. I didn't want to destroy it, damage it, ruin it, mess it up. I wanted to enjoy it, but I was keenly aware it didn't belong to me. My body doesn't belong to me. Your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Jesus. And so that's sort of a base level reality that we have to agree to before we can even talk about the specifics of how we approach sexuality. If I fundamentally believe I should be able to do whatever I want to do with my body, that I'm missing what the scripture says. If you are in Christ, Jesus died in your place for the forgiveness of your sins and mine, and he rose from the dead, and he purchased me, body and spirit, at the cost of his own life. I belong to him. I don't belong to myself. So God cares about how we use our bodies because they bear his image, they belong to Jesus. And then lastly, because, and this is really important, our bodies will rise again. What I mean is that our bodies themselves have an eternal character to them, an immortal character to them. This is, I said I would come back to this in, in chapter six, verse 14. Now God indeed raised the Lord and he will raise us by his power. That the body that you and I carry around, because of what Jesus has done, has an eternal character. That our ultimate destiny, in fact, is not just to die and then our spirit goes to heaven, but the day is actually coming because Jesus rose bodily, you and I will rise bodily. That's a really central piece of the Christian faith. Jesus dignified and validated the worth of my physical body and your physical body and its eternality when he rose from the dead and he stood before his disciples. And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago and he showed them the scars in his hands and in his side, the scars that he will bear forever because Jesus is eternally the God man. So that when John sees Jesus again in the book of Revelation, he sees him as a lamb who has been slain. That is, Jesus still bears the scars of his death. Even in his eternal resurrection, he is forever a God-man who took on a human body to validate 
and provide worth to your body and mine and to provide the promise of resurrection. Why is this important? Because it means that my body isn't just a husk that I can abuse and use as I want and then toss it away. I don't know, some of you may remember before COVID, if you went to Texas Roadhouse, they had these giant barrels of peanuts that you could just reach in. Some of you are like, mm, right, I could hear that, okay. You could reach in and grab these handfuls of peanuts and then you would just, you would shell them and eat the peanut inside and then you could drop the shells on the ground in the restaurant so that as you walked around, there were just all of these peanut shells on the ground. I loved that. My kids loved that. And yet nobody walked around and was like picking up the shells, right, to save the peanut shells. They were, they were disposable. They were just the husk. The good stuff was inside. Now, why do I share that? I think some of us think about our bodies that way. It's just a shell. It's just a husk. I just need to get rid of it. That's actually an anti-Christian philosophy. But the Christian understanding of humanity is you are body and spirit together. God made you body and spirit together in his image. Jesus died and rose again to redeem you, body and spirit together in his image. What that means is because we are destined for bodily resurrection one day, our bodies have an eternal character and nature. And that means everything that we do with our bodies is designed to honor and reflect God and God's glory and God's character because he owns us and because he's redeemed us. This is why a little bit later in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul would say, look, if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is useless. You are still in your sins. In other words, if Jesus didn't emerge from that tomb, not just as a spirit, but as a resurrected body, if that didn't happen, you are still in your sins. You are going to die. Your body will die forever and you will be separated from God. He says, furthermore, those who have fallen asleep in Christ, those who have died knowing Jesus, they perish. They're gone. They're in the grave. For if only in this life we have hope in Christ, only in this life we have hope in Christ, we should be pitied more than anyone. If resurrection doesn't happen, then we've got it all wrong. And he says, look, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink. For tomorrow we die. This libertarian attitude of the body can only come from a heart that denies the reality of the resurrection. But because Jesus rose, we will rise. Because we will rise, that means everything that we do now carries an eternal import. What I think, what I say, where I go, what I do. And Paul had made the point in 1 Corinthians 6, that's especially true in this area of sexuality, All right? So our bodies bear his image. They belong to Jesus. They will rise again. So next week, we're gonna talk about male and female in God's image, why that's so important. In a couple of weeks, we'll talk about God's positive vision for marriage and for sex. And then we will end the series by talking about uh, sexual brokenness and sin and how do we want to address that as followers of Jesus Christ and avoid that. But before we get into that over the next few weeks, again, I want to come back to this question we talked about at the beginning, very simply. Will you and I submit our behaviors and beliefs about sexuality to the authority of God's word? Will you and I simply say, God, I trust your word, that your design is best, your way is best? Because without that posture of submission, we can talk about specifics all day long. But there's always going to be a part of us that resists and pushes back, that wants to do our own thing. So from the beginning, will we submit our behaviors and beliefs about sexuality to the authority of God's word? Uh, I'm going to ask, I, I'm going to, uh, I've got a couple other thoughts I, I want to bring up before we wrap up today. But let me, let me ask a favor of you. Um, I, I, if some of you are willing, scan this QR code and there's a little short survey that I would be interested in, in having you fill out before we move forward with the rest of our series. Um, now, let me say this. It is optional. Nobody has to fill it out. There's a couple of personal questions on there, and I realize that, and so I, I don't want anybody to feel uncomfortable. But I want to see even where do we land as a congregation 
on some of these issues related to sexuality and to gender and to our understanding of it uh, from the scripture. And so if you're willing to fill that out, that would be great. We will, it's anonymous, by the way. We're not gonna see your name attached to it, but we will see kind of the aggregated results. So we can see, like, where are we as a congregation? And here's what I wanna ask again, is as you're thinking about that and as you're, as you're filling it out and as we're thinking about this area of sexuality, again, do we actually believe that God is more like the second lady in the story I told at the beginning? That true freedom comes from following his pathway rather than our own. All right, that's 2 Corinthians 3. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. Now, look at this. And where the Spirit of the Lord is present, there is not restriction, but freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, reflecting the glory of the Lord, that's what we're made for, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, which is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We are designed to reflect him and radiate his glory because he loves us, because he made us for that purpose. And he wants us to be free and joyful. So again, will we submit our behaviors and beliefs about sexuality to the authority of God's word? I realize also, as we talk about this topic, that almost everybody in this room, if not everybody, if we're honest with ourselves, we would say, when I look at my past, maybe a year ago, 10 years ago, maybe yesterday, maybe this morning, but when I look at my past, I say, I know already that I have failed with my beliefs and my thoughts and my behaviors to reflect God's word and God's standards in this area of sexuality. We say, I failed. I've been hurt and I've hurt other people. I've hurt myself and I've hurt God. I, I, would, I would be as bold as to say, I think that's probably everybody in the room in one way or another. And so, of course, the message that we want to communicate is that, that in Jesus Christ, this is why Jesus died and Jesus rose. There is forgiveness and there is new life in Jesus so that past sins do not separate us from the life that God has for us. But because of his forgiveness, we have a future, a hope, not only in this life, but in the next, a hope of resurrection and eternal life. If you have not believed in Jesus Christ, do please come talk with me, come talk with one of our staff. We'd love to tell you about the hope of Jesus Christ and that hope of resurrection. If you believed in him, then the question becomes, will I begin today and say, God, I trust you. I trust you with my body. I trust you with my thoughts. I trust you with everything about my life. I want to submit my behaviors and beliefs about sexuality to your authority because I belong to you. Would you pray with me? Father, we're so thankful for your word. It is convicting, but it is also deeply life-giving. We pray that we would trust you and submit our hearts and our lives to your word and, and believe that you know and want what is best for us. God, make us faithful to you. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior, who died and rose again. So we have the hope of resurrection and eternal life. It is in Jesus' name we pray, amen.